Well, we have some stunning breaking news in the college campuses. Multiple reports in Pennsylvania say that Liz McGill, the president of the University of Pennsylvania, has resigned from her post at the elite Ivy League school. You know, this comes after that intense backlash to her testimony and that of others on Capitol Hill this past week, after she said calling for the genocide of Jews is harassment, depending on the context. We're told the UPenn Board of Trustees reportedly held an emergency meeting about all this, and McGill, we are told, will reportedly stay on as interim president of UPenn until uh, an interim president is appointed. She will continue uh, her work as a faculty member on the faculty of that elite Ivy League school. You know, uh, her resignation uh, could be the first of several others. That hearing sparked a fury of controversy as the president of Harvard, Clyding Gay. She had to walk back and then apologize for her not condemning calls for genocide against Jews that have been heard on the elite Ivy League campuses the past few weeks. Miguel, uh, the UPenn president, also did not criticize such language during that hearing. Uh, it is seen as a widespread condemnation uh, of the failures of higher education in this country and the values that some of our students are being taught when these universities cannot even condemn the genocide of Jews. I want to break this down in, in my way. I haven't seen anybody with my take on it. So uh, I don't, that's very disappointing. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not seeing, looking at the right people. I have not seen one person call this out as unconstitutional. I'd like to hear what Robert Barnes, is a lawyer that I highly respect, I would really like to hear what Robert Barnes thinks about this. Uh, because this is clearly, I mean, I'm not really even debating it. I, I want to hear other people's opinion, but I am not debating this. This is unconstitutional. Here's, here's the main clip that went viral. At Penn, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct? Yes or no? If the speech turns into conduct, it can be harassment. Yes. I, I am asking, specifically calling for the genocide of Jews, does that constitute bullying or harassment? If it is directed and severe or pervasive, it is harassment. So the answer is yes. It is a context-dependent decision, Congresswoman. It's a context-dependent decision. That's your testimony today. Calling for the genocide of Jews is depending upon the context. That is not bullying or harassment. This is the easiest question to answer yes, Ms. McGill. Mm. Oh, so she has to answer So is your you testimony it, that it, you will not answer yes? If it... Uh, is if the yes speech or becomes, no. if the speech becomes conduct it can be harassment yes conduct meaning committing the act of genocide the speech is not harassment this is unacceptable Ms. mcgill i'm going to give you one more opportunity what? for the world to see your answer does calling for the genocide of jews violate penn's code of conduct when it comes to bullying and harassment yes or no it can be harassment. The answer is yes. Oh, so she literally told her what the answer was supposed to be. My patience is wearing thin. I need you to get out on that boulevard and bring me my money. You ain't my pimp, nigga. The hell is wrong with these people? What is going on? Since when do we do this? And I guess because a lot of people agree with Elise Stefanik here, nobody wants to call it unconstitutional. This take here has nothing to do with Israel, Palestine, this has nothing to do with that stuff. It has nothing to do with even anti-Semitism. This is about what is the purpose of Congress? What do they have? What, what authority, constitutional authority do they have to do this? That's what this is about. After you see this situation, this unconstitutional beatdown, this is the statement released, and I think Glenn Greenwald described this as a hostage victim. There was a moment during yesterday's congressional hearing on anti-Semitism when I was asked if a call for the genocide of Jewish people on our campus would violate our policies. In that moment, I was focused on our university's longstanding policies aligned with the US Constitution, which say that speech alone is not punishable. I was not focused on, but I should have been. The irrefutable fact that a call for genocide of Jewish people is a call for some of the most terrible violence human beings can perpetrate. It's evil, plain and simple. 
I want to be clear. A call for genocide of Jewish people is threatening, deeply so. It is intentionally meant to terrify a people who have been subjected to pogroms and hatred for centuries and were the victims of mass genocide in the Holocaust. In my view, it would be harassment or intimidation. Because mm, I told you it was. For decades, under multiple Penn presidents and consistent with most universities, Penn's policies have been guided by the Constitution and the law. Oh, we don't do that anymore. In today's world, <laughs> we are seeing signs of hate proliferating across our campus oh, and our world okay. in a way not seen in years. These policies need to be clarified oh. and evaluated. Penn must initiate a serious and careful look at our policies. Mm -hmm. And Provost Jackson and I will immediately convene a process to do so. Yeah, yeah. As president, I'm committed to a safe, secure, and supportive environment so all members of our community can thrive. We can and we will get this right. Thank you. Because Congress told you it was. Now let's talk about the genocide comments first. At Penn, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct? They're very, they're very general with this calling for genocide. What does that mean? Is that literally what somebody said? Or are you breaking down Antifada or decolonization or from the river to the sea? Are you calling those calls for genocide? That's very vague. Let's go back to, before we get into this, who, how could you support, nobody's supporting genocide. This isn't even about that. Either the speech is legal or it's illegal. That's all that matters. There is no hate. There is no, I don't like this. Oh, somebody said Antifada. Either it's legal or it's not. The only thing Congress has authority over is legislation. They don't determine what is legal speech or not. So you can't bring in a private in company and then tell them this is bad speech. Your policy should address that. That is unconstitutional. It's very simple and plain. And here's how slippery the slope is. Remember when Michael Knowles had that moment here. People to this day believe that Michael Knowles was calling for the genocide of trans people. Then for the good of society, and especially for the good of the poor people who have fallen prey to this confusion, transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. The whole preposterous ideology at every level. He knows that people might, in my opinion, in writing this, that people might misconstrue his words. So before he says eradicate transgenderism, and it's really built in the title of it, he said ism, just like somebody says eradicate racism. He said eradicate transgenderism. He didn't say eradicate trans people. It's in the, it's already built in. He didn't need to qualify it, but it, but he still did. Listen to this. For the good of the poor people who have fallen. So before he said the say, he said, even for the good of the poor people, in his opinion, I'm not trying to argue this. I'm just telling you, I'm, we're going to compare this to from the river to the sea. So he, so he, even before he said it, he said, I'm even saying this in my opinion to help. That's why I tell people there's no such thing as hate speech. Some people think that's hate speech. He's telling you, I'm doing it out of love for you. So one person's version of hate is another person's version of love. That's why that term has no meaning. ...who have fallen prey to this confusion. Transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. So he did the sandwich approach. Before it, let me just be clear, I'm not saying this to hate on anybody. Then he says, in his opinion, he wants to eradicate transgenderism. I, at that time, I replied and said, that's as ridiculous as saying I want to eradicate racism. It's, both of them are equally as ridiculous. So I'm not trying to justify his statement. Stay with me here. People get lost on this. I'm just talking about his speech. Is it legal or not? It's obviously legal. So he goes through, and then now he sandwiches it with... The whole preposterous ideology. The whole ideology to make sure people don't know, people know it's not about people. And still to this day, there are many people who think he literally meant eradicate people. And what we're seeing in that hearing is who gets to decide what that, 
the speech is that's why i say it's ego, either legal speech or it's illegal so it's not i'm not beholden to your warped interpretation so his speech is legal so i don't care what you you might misinterpret it as whatever it is fine go out go ahead and misinterpret it it's legal speech that doesn't mean i mean you can still be fired from your job all that but from the point of congress they have no say in that none at any point any way any shape form the only thing Congress does, the only thing Congress has authority to is to write legislation and pass legislation. So when they do the hearings and bring people in, it has to be for a legislative purpose. If it's for any other purpose, they don't have they don't have constitutional authority. So they can't bring the college in and say, well, Michael Knowles said eradicate transgender. No, 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 no. That's legal speech. You compare that to from the river to the sea or whatever. She's very general. Elise Stefanik saying, well, there are, they're calling for the, the genocide of Jews. Like, what, what is that? That's a very generic statement. Here's how I describe what happened here. And I'm going to give you my answer to what if Elise, St if I was a true university that was independent from the government, that's a whole, that's part of this topic too. These are, they're both on the same team. The university and Elise Stefanik, she's a corporate, you know, she's she's kind of warmed up to Meg. She's a corporate shill. I don't look at the party of these people. She's warmed up to, and obviously pro-Israel. So she, Israel first politician, like every single other politician, basically. So she is on the same team as the universities. What they're arguing about is how to destroy our country. But let me back up. What we witnessed with Elise Stefanik with that shakedown they have total disregard for the constitution total and utter disregard what that means is they have disregard for your rights it doesn't matter if you agree with stefanic here because she's a part of, re of removing your right your answer does calling for the genocide of jews violate penn's code of conduct when it comes to bullying and harassment yes or no see either that speech whatever this calling for the genocide of jews is Either that speech is legal or it's not legal. That's not Congress's determination. They can't determine that. If they had a court case, they could bring that in and say, wait, there's a court case that said this speech was illegal and you did this. That's different because it's like, that's a legal speech. Are you, are you backing your, Congress isn't making the determination. It's already been made. She just get bringing up a generic scenario, genocide of Jews. Wait, I don't know. Is that a legal speech or not? That's what matters. And that's not my determination. That's not the president's determination. It comes to bullying and harassment. Yes or no. It can be harassment. The answer is yes. And then she acquiesced and said it can be. She said it can be. And then a member of Congress, a legisl the legislative branch, a politician said, this is what your answer has to be on the policy of a private company. They could do the same thing to Public Square. They could bring Public Square into a hearing and say, Public Square, this company X, if you don't know, Public Square is like an Amazon, but what they do is they bring on certain companies that... I don't even know how to describe it, or anti-establishment maybe, or right, I don't know, for the lack of a better term, right wing or anti-establishment, non-corporate non blue bootlickers for the most part, basically. So they'll have people, let's just do, do this. So Public Square would have somebody, like they would have a skating rink that didn't require COVID masks. And they'll say, they'll say, hey, do you want to find a business that doesn't require masks so you feel comfortable if you don't want to wear a mask? So what you're what you're setting up here is because these are private universities. They didn't bring up the they didn't bring in the public universities. They can't even do anything there. That would be way over the bounds. They brought in the private universities and said, "This speech that I'm giving you, this hypothetical situation, you have to you ha your code of conduct has to match my opinion." So they could bring in under the same type of auspice. They could bring in Public Square and say, "Public Square." Why do you have companies on your app that support going against the COVID policies? And then they might say, well, I don't, I, because I have the free speech to do so. And then they could respond to them and say, no, that's the wrong answer. The answer is yes.
Man, y'all letting these people get way out of line. And I'm included in that as well. Way out of line. I said what we witnessed in that illegal anti-Semitism hearing was unconstitutional domestic violence, like a pimp beating their hoe. That's what we saw. The pimp in that scenario is the federal government. The answer is yes. It's Elise Stefanik, and it's awkward because it's all happening in public, and we're watching her beat her hoe, which is Liz M M uh, McGill. President of the University of Pennsylvania, Liz McGill, has resigned, and we've just gotten word that the chair of the University of Pennsylvania's board of trustees, Scott Bach, has also resigned, effective immediately. And they did it in public for a reason. The federal government gives these private organizations, just in total, all of them, billions, student aid, they pay for the loans. The schools don't have to back the loans. Could you, could you imagine running a business where the government gives the loans to your customers to buy your product? Oh, man, that'd be some good money, wouldn't it? <laughs> It'd be some good money. And you don't take any risk in the loans. Wow. But so the, And then imagine that same government brings you into a congressional hearing to cover your legal right as a private organization to to govern and have a policy for legal speech however you want it's not like the universities have a policy where illegal speech can happen so they bring them in and they can take away they can figure out different ways to take away this aid from you covid aid has been happening probably still happening some of them still have vaccine man mandates why do you think they still have why do you think they even had vaccine mandates because of this conflict of interest and then a lot of money for research that's easy to take away so any type of funding is in jeopardy if Liz answers wrong there. The executive and the legislative branch, they beat their prostitutes out in the open on purpose. They could have done that behind the scenes. Why did they do it out on purpose? And everybody, well, the people who are engaged are watching this. It's to send a message to every private com com company in this country, from social media to public square to rumble to... The Ripperverse just got the Alpha Core to Ripperverse. Imagine Ripperverse keeps on this trajectory and blows up. <laughs> That'd be funny to see Eric July. I would like to see Eric July up in there. He'd be wrecking. He would wreck shop up in there. <laughs> As I've said to those of you fucking weirdos who was like, oh, it's just a fucking vaccine. This is not a big deal. Just get the jet. Is that the hill that you want to die on? Yes, 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 that's the fucking hill worth dying on. It always was. Could you imagine them bringing Eric July in for a hearing? But that it's a message sent to every, every corporation in this country, from Disney to BlackRock to everything. These university presidents are not stupid. So I had a, I, I, I put in my head, I was like, okay, so how would I answer this if I were in front of these, um, people trying to pimp me around like this. Let me try to bring it back and then put an answer to it. At Penn, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct? Yes or no? You have no authority as a legislative body to tell a private company, my private company, what my code of conduct should be in regards to legal speech. If you have questions for me, that come with constitutional authority because you don't determine if speech is legal or not. I'm here to answer them, but I'm not answering these questions that have nothing to do with constitutional legislation. If you continue down this path, I'm going to file a federal lawsuit to get a judicial declaration that these congressional actions are unlawful. Am I understood? These people are smarter than I am. They know that, they could answer with that, they've got lawyers. Why don't they answer like that? Because what you're doing, this is coming from MAGA and right wing and even libertarians in a way. They're ne they would never say an answer like that because Congress is actually giving them the ability to go against their political enemies. TPUSA is in some private universities. You can say, hey, university, the, so they're, they're, they're going through this and they say, you know, she said in that clip, we used to go by the Constitution. In that moment, I was focused on our university's longstanding policies aligned with the U.S. Constitution, which say that speech alone is not punishable. And the law, 
But now we have to review that. Penn's policies have been guided by the Constitution and the law. Oh, we don't do that anymore. In today's world, <laughs> we are seeing signs of hate proliferating across our campus oh, and our world okay. in a way not seen in years. These policies need to be clarified oh. and evaluated. So what they're saying is, is, okay, Congress is pushing us to ban speech that they don't like. So TPS, we have a chapter, a TPUSA chapter. If you don't know, they just... I mean, it's just a, a student organization group from high school to college that Charlie Kirk runs, Tyler uh, Bowen's in part of, many other people, and they basically make it okay for you to be non-liberal, neoliberal. It's, you're okay to not be a neocon, and you can be around other people who aren't like that. Famously, Anna Paulina Luna was a graduate of that. Um, Candace Owens used to be, I believe, their, one of their communications people. And it gives you a route to build and a pool of candidates that you could choose to be cabinet positions. Or, you know, okay, you're with TPUSA. I know you're a non-bootlicker from the left standpoint. And so Michael Knowles was speaking for TPS. Oh, he, that was CPAC. But let's just pretend because I, you know, Charlie Kirk would have no problem with that statement about eradicating transgenderism. You could just hypothetically, they could say, wait a second, your school has a TPUSA branch. They are for the eradication of transgenderism, therefore the genocide of trans people. People believe that to this day. You're there for the genocide of trans people. You have to shut that down. Of course they could do that. They, I mean, now they've got congressional backing to do that. So I, w I said, TPUSA, get your lawyers ready. I said, are you paying attention, Charlie Kirk, Tyler? Boyer, I think I said Boyer, Boyer. This is the end of TPUSA on private colleges, campuses at some point. Get your lawyers ready. Private organizations are getting bullied but they aren't that much against this because they're on the same team. This is an intra-squad battle. They're just having a disagreement on how to destroy our country and take our rights away. This is what they really mean by a living constitution. I think a lot of times when people talk about a living constitution, they think about the Supreme Court and how they interpret the constitution. And yes, that's true. But the Supreme Court, court can't interpret things that go too far against public sentiment. That's what happened in 2020 when they turned down Texas v. Pennsylvania. That we had the riots, the summer of love. Basically, the riots in the summer of, the, of love, in my opinion, scared the Supreme Court because if they take the case and they have to rule in a way that goes against the same people that rioted and basically burned down many cities and the, damn near the whole country, then they don't like that. They're basically there to ensure non-riots non is how they view themselves very much, the Supreme Court. So that's why some of you go back through their decisions. Some of their decisions are all over the place, and I think that's, it depends on where the country is at the time. Not that every decision would do a riot, but I think that's a lot of what they choose. That's why it was shocking what, with the Roe v. Wade stuff. But when they say living constitution, the base of the foundation of the living constitution is culture. And if they make it okay for Congress to bring in a private company and tell them what their policy should be, basically what they're doing there is the exact same thing that they talked about the Twitter files, but they're just doing it out in the open with a different industry. If you make that culture okay, First Amendment wiped away, gone. So now when something goes to the Supreme Court, it doesn't matter how right or liberal or conservative the Supreme Court is, they'll side in that direction. Y'all better be careful now. Let's take a look at the comments. Mike has bad knees. What's good? Says, once you take their money, you're beholden to their rules. That's the problem. It's a big problem. And really, we as citizens should make sure to say, hey, whoa. Now, some people have said this. They said, well, the universities have never been constitutional. Because they say stuff like, if you misgender someone or whatever the radical left, the radical left thing is, they support it. That's what the Palestine thing is. So they, they support that, but they don't support people on the other side. That's their prerogative. It's the private institution. The public institutions, to my knowledge, can't do that. Public universities can't do that. 
They shouldn't be able to. They're public universities, but the private ones can. I, just, I, don't, I don't think there's any way around that. But you could argue, like Mike has bad knees, is saying once you take their money, if you start taking, am I really a, am I really a private company if the government is subsidizing the loans for my customers? You could make that same argument just like social media. That's my argument with social media. If they were truly private companies, you couldn't do that. But they're public forums that should be basically public utilities. That's the argument with social media. So, yeah, you could argue, is are they really private universities? I think you could really argue that. I think we're at the point where clearly that that's a big deal right now. Thanks, as always. Mike has bad, uh, Mike has bad knees. Um, I'm sure you got that alpha. Did you get your alpha core? I don't know if you replied in there. I see if you, I don't know if you even got it, but I saw you in um, July's live. Uh, old Jim Bob said, "I just imagined the politician with a walking cane and flashing leopard skin top hat jacket combo." They they say for public speaking, imagine the audience. I, it actually works for me to imagine the audience naked. Makes you more comfortable, and you're and you have your clothes on. It's actually I think it's actually a really cool psychological. Uh, kind of experiment. Steve Johnson, uh, a friend of the show, always good to see you. Hopefully your kid's doing well. I forgot, was it a boy or girl? I forgot. Hopefully that's, hopefully you're doing well as a proud papa. Stefanik says, specifically while being generic and not proposing specific examples. <laughs> that's a good one. I completely missed that. This is exactly right. She used the word specifically in there while being just generic. I am asking specifically calling for the genocide of Jews, does that constitute bullying or harassment? And I don't think there's any example that you could use. But here's, here's, let me, you know, one of the things in corporate America, you always say, don't complain unless you have an answer. And it, I think you could legitimately, and this, this might have been part of the hearing, it was a five hour hearing, I did not hear the whole hearing. I might have to go back since I'm writing a lot about it, I'm gonna to have to go back and maybe listen to the whole damn five hours, believe it or not. But I think part of it, I think it could be legit. If you bring, if you bring in the universities, because remember, I was very upset that Jewish people got chased up into an attic at, I forget what university it was, in New York or something. Jewish students, they were hiding in the library. It's not funny. Well, Maurice, students here tell me that school staff locked them in the library this afternoon due to safety concerns. The NYPD tells us there were no arrests, no injuries, and no property damage. It also says that this was a planned demonstration, and the NYPD is reviewing video. This video shows a group of Jewish students standing in the Cooper Union Library as other students chant Free Palestine outside locked doors and hold up signs outside the glass. It was tense. It, people were nervous. They were specifically acting very aggressive in those spaces where outwardly Jewish students were sitting. The librarians ran over to us and they were like, we tried to warn you, but we just got notice that they're coming down. I genuinely don't know what would have happened if the doors were left open. The students say they were studying in the library after attending an earlier rally in Cooper Plaza. A representative from Cooper Union says the library was closed for approximately 20 minutes in the late afternoon and that students chose to stay in the library until the protest was over. Security escorted us from the library to this building or outside to where people left to go home. But it's just so ironic. It's just mind-blowing. If this is true, maybe it was just upstairs, but it's still just too close that there is a pro-Palestine rally going on in the university and the Jewish students got chased up into the upstairs of the library, damn near like Anne Frank up in the, in the attic. And I think it would be legit if Congress brought them in and said, okay, and you'd, you'd have to have a legal case you couldn't even use that one unless they pressed charges or sued even and even then you couldn't use it unless there was a judgment to me but just hypothetically say they had a case that said hey you chase these people up and they got chased up in the attic they sued and they won let's talk about what are we doing to ensure peace on the camp you're not when you're not telling one you're not telling them this speech is better than that speech we have illegal acts that's happened on the campus that's not safe. 
What are the policies? And I think that's legitimate. Also, what's legitimate? You might have heard of this. There was this Palestinian Palestinian group. I think it was in New York again. I forget where. They're outside this Jewish spot called Goldie. And last night in downtown Philly at one of his falafel shops called Goldie, hundreds of pro-Palestinian protesters chanted outside of his restaurant, targeting it because it's Jewish owned. Listen. The protesters graffitied multiple businesses as they marched downtown and through University of Pennsylvania's campus, chanting even at Eagles fans as they were watching the Sunday night football game at sports sports bars while calling for an intifada. And they're out there, I don't know, it looked like a few hundred of them, but I, it's hard to count, yelling, you know, Goldie, Goldie, you can't hide. We convict you of genocide or something like that. They're out there yelling. And I think it would be fair for Congress to bring in the DA, the local DA, the local police, what do they call him, chief, and say, you have laws on your book. Help me. You tell me. Congress can't interpret that and say what well, something's legal or not. You can bring them, though, though, in in Congress and say, well, here's the law of you need a you need a permit to have more than 100 people on the sidewalk or something like that. Or the, and the other legal you know, laws of threats and harassment and say, you tell me why or why not was this incident legal or illegal and why wasn't anybody charged or arrest, arrested? That would have been fair because Congress isn't promoting one speech or not they're not determining if something's legal or not and they could be doing it to create federal legislation which i'm not really a fan even in that case i'm tired of the legislation we need to repeal some legislation right now but just to tell you what i think would be legit that part would be legit it's absolutely illegitimate for congress to come in and say wrong answer on your code of conduct I don't even know why I have to explain that to people, why that's a problem. I really don't.